For many people, the public health imperative for the 21st century is really to be able to deliver health and well-being for people, equity between different groups in society, and very importantly, sustainability. Sustainability is necessary if we are going to be able to give future generations a proper world to inherit. So the inherit model is a way of thinking how we can develop policies which will deliver these three things simultaneously. We call this the triple win. The triple win being equity, health and well-being and sustainability. Now in order to do that we know that we have to operate within very complex territory to identify policies which will work. And the use of conceptual models is quite well developed within public health as a discipline and the inherent model is no different from a great many others in that respect. It's a simplification of an extraordinarily complex real world situation. Yet the inherent model has a number of characteristics which set it apart from things that have gone before. First of all, it recognises the modern imperative of sustainability. In other words, it's no longer going to be sufficient just to produce health, well-being and equity. If we do that in ways which are damaging to the planet, then we have absolutely no chance of delivering health or delivering health care or equity in any of these things in the medium to longer term. As a result, we need ways of navigating in complexity and that's exactly what the inherent model is designed to do. It is essentially a linear model. It, draw, it, it describes the situation or depicts the situation leading from the higher level drivers which create pressures, which change the physical environment around us and in turn go on to create exposures for or indeed experiences for the people who live in that physical environment and then go on to influence their health and well-being. If you look at the inherent model, the most obvious thing probably is that on the right hand side of the model you will see that there are two pathways leading from higher level interacting drivers of which can be a whole range of issues right the way through to health and well-being. And those two pathways are different because one passes through what we call the proximal environment, the area around us, the here and now as far as we are concerned, and the other one passes through the global ecosystems which we now realise are so important for our health and well-being. As a result, the model tries to show these two pathways and recognises that the very same drivers may well lead to impacts on global ecosystems and the services that they provide for us, plus at the same time impacting the, the local environment in ways which can be very important for our health and well-being. The model also allows us to understand how these pathways at their various points on the pathway lead to unequal outcomes. So any component within these pathways may not be the same for an individual or the same for a particular place. And the way the model captures that is by creating what we call a contextual bubble, which is essentially a cloud which surrounds those pathways. And the cloud will be social factors, economic factors, or indeed um, cultural or historic factors, all of which are, are very specific to the place in which we are applying the model. So the model can be applied to different issues and different places and will appear different when we do that. When you look at the model, you'll see that there are magnifying glass symbols which appear in the driver's box and they also are inserted on the proximal pathway between physical environment and exposure, exper oblique experience, and also between experience, exposure and health and well-being. And that's simply to say that those are places or points within these pathways where human behaviour is hugely important. 
and where if we can target human behaviour, we may well be able to make a profound influence and outcome. The Inherit project is very much characterised by, by influencing or trying to find policies which influence the way we behave as we live, move and consume and the, way, and the factors which influence those behaviours and in so doing impact positively on health, well-being, equity and sustainability. The inherent model has a clear behavioural component, or two actually. So on the left side of the model, there's the behavioural change wheel, developed by Michi et al. And on the right side of the model, we have uh, three uh, behavioural hotspots. Um, so on the left side of the model, the behavioural change wheel uh, actually consists of an action part with policy categories and intervention functions and a behavioural component with capability, opportunity and motivation. The first one is capability, which is really about having the knowledge and the skills to perform a behaviour. For example, cooking a vegetarian meal. And then there's opportunity, which can be physical opportunity and social opportunity. So for example, having uh, a supermarket that has a lot of meat alternatives, but also having a family that's supportive uh, if you want to eat less meat. Um, the third one is motivation, which is really all brain processes that energize behavior. This involves both more reflective processes, um, such as consciously deciding to eat less meat, uh, but it's also more automatic. Um, so a lot of our consumption behavior is habitual, which means that if we go shopping, we don't uh, consciously decide to buy meat. We just do it because we have always done so. Um, these three elements of cap capability, opportunity and motivation interact uh, and they influence behavior. And behavior in its turn also influences the three elements. When you want to understand a behavior, it's important to know uh, which elements are the most important. Sometimes capability plays a big role when you want to change behavior. Other times it's more motivation. So what gets people out of their cars and onto their bicycles? Or what gets people to eat less meat? When you know where the problem lies, you can really develop more effective action. Wrapped around the behavioral part is an action part with intervention functions that influence the behavioral elements. So for example, there's training. Um, you could provide cooking workshops to increase people's capability to cook. Around the intervention functions ring, there's a policy category ring, which can be used to support implementation of the intervention functions. For example, fiscal measures can be used to make meat alternatives more affordable, which increases people's opportunity to actually buy these alternatives. Regarding the hotspots, the first one is among the drivers, which is actually an important entry point for action as it targets both pathways. Um, so for example, in our uh, Western cultures, it's really normal and valued to eat a lot of meat for dinner, for example. And this interacts with the commercial driver or economic driver of meat industries who are trying to meet that demand um, and actually facilitate meat consumption. The other behavioral hotspots are lower in the pathway. And they make explicit that behavior, among other contextual modifiers, is a modifier of the relationship between the physical environment and health and well-being. For example, living in a community with a lot of fast food outlets doesn't necessarily mean that you become overweight. You have to actually enter those fast food outlets and eat there on multiple occasions. It's also important uh, that you have compensatory behaviors. So you can eat at fast food outlets a lot of times, but if you also be, are physically active a lot of the time, or on the other occasions of the week you eat very healthy, you also don't necessarily have to become overweight. A key feature of the inherent model is the contextual bubble. It is, if you like, surrounds both of the pathways, the proximal pathway and the distal pathway. And what that tries to convey is that every transition between individual components of those pathways is influenced by a wider context, which might be social, economic, cultural, historical, demographic. In fact, any of the factors other than the environment and health relationship, which the, the pathway is designed to show. But what it means really is that that context 
makes it more or less likely that I as an individual or you as an individual might be exposed to a particular characteristic of environment and whether or not that particular characteristic of environment, say for example pollution or indeed a positive exposure like an exposure to green space will go on to have an impact on our health and well-being, positive or negative. Thus far I've described the inherent model in a very generic way. The inherent model is what we call a relational model. It shows the way particular components relate to one another and we hope that is really helpful in understanding or at least navigating within the complex world. It looks at complexity, if you like, through the prism of the relationship between environment and human health and we hope it's helpful in that way and people tell us it's helpful in that way. However, if we want to apply it to a particular situation, uh, one thing that we intuitively understand is that if we have policies, we usually direct those policies towards some sort of unsatisfactory circumstance that we want to change. So what we do is we use the inherent model to map particular challenges. So we might use it for, for, for challenges in relation to the way we live in society, the way we move or the way we consume in society. Thus, we might use it map towards an issue like transport or we might map towards consumption issues, say around food, or we might map, map it to the way we, we live, something like green space or the quality of housing. And when we do these mapping, what we in, um, call populating the model for a particular challenge, we create something called a generic challenge model. If I were to use the example of um, energy inefficient housing, a lack of investment in housing, the way people behave, perhaps the, the, the climatic conditions in a particular area, perhaps previous policies, a whole range of things contribute to pressures which create housing which is more or less energy efficient. So for example, we may well starve houses of investment or have a historical legacy of properties which are poorly insulated or are not amenable to being insulated or heated in a good way and the result is that you have a cold internal environment. Your environmental state within that house might be cold, it might be damp, it might be mouldy. That would lead on to an exposure, perhaps exposure to cold temperatures or indeed the inhalation of fungal spores or house dust mites or one of the things that accompanies um, uh, having a cold damp house. It may mean that people restrict their use of the house, they, they don't visit the colder parts of the house, thereby creating a kind of uh, essentially a, a, an artificial form of overcrowding within a house which may nonetheless be very important for their health and that in turn will lead to outcomes for example like respiratory outcomes or cardiovascular outcomes or in some very extreme cases, um, hypothermia. So you can see that we can populate the model through drivers, pressures, environment, exposure, experience, on to health and well-being, and we can start to think about the contextual issues like socio-economic factors or demographic factors which might influence not only the environmental state we have, but people's exposure to it and their then the health effects that that might have on them. And we call this populating the model for a particular issue to create a generic challenge model. The next stage in the process is that we then map on the policies which we wish to evaluate onto that model, onto that generic challenge model. So a policy might, for example, seek to influence the environmental state or, our, or of energy and efficient housing. So that might be a policy directed towards um, the insulation levels in housing. One might say, I'm going to um, increase the levels of insulation in this, in this property. And that as a result might be beneficial for housing, although it might be beneficial for health, sorry, but it might equally, um, there might be a, a, a 
an un unintended consequence. A classic unintended consequence would be where we tighten up the house, we reduce the amount of air exchange between the home and the external air in order to try and save energy and create a warmer environment, but actually we make the house more polluted by concentrating the pollutants that are generated within the house, leading to poor health outcomes. So we would have an unintended consequence. But all, what all of this points to is that when we populate these models for a particular issue, in a multiple stakeholder environment, we can actually get a very rich understanding, not only of the issue that we're trying to address, but where policies can be directed towards that and whether those policies work in terms of a very logical sequence. In other words, do they do what we expect them to do? And importantly, and very specific to inherit, where we're seeking to change behaviour with those policies, whether it be of policy makers or the individuals who are experiencing the house or whatever environment it is, we are actually able to see whether or not those policies are in keeping with what we understand about behaviour and what causes people to behave in particular ways. And as a result, can effectively change those policies.